Hello friends, this video on heredity and evolution part 19 is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. So now that we have concluded our discussion on evolution, it would be incomplete if we do not talk something about human evolution. After all, we are all human beings. So let us see what is there in store for us for our evolution. From where did we evolve? You would have seen that even though we all are human beings, all of us have some or the other similarities and differences, right? There are some people who look very different than some other people. So in human beings also, we see uh, many different types of people, right? Some of them have got very fair skin complexion. Some of them have got a dusky skin complexion. Some of them have got different types of features, right? Which make them look very different. Now, in earlier days, many people had this thought that different, differently looking human beings belong to different species, which was completely wrong. Even though they look different because of, because of many factors, maybe because of the climate where they live in or because of the food habits which they have, because of which or there are certain genetic changes as well. But all human beings belong to the same species. They are all homo sapiens. Right. So now the evolution of human beings is also very interesting. So here you can see in this picture, which actually shows the gradual evolution of human beings. You see our common ancestor were apes. Right. So that is why you will see a lot of similarities between apes or chimpanzees or the monkeys with human beings. Right. Because we also evolved from one of their forms. So every human being, irrespective of how they look or how their features are or how their hair color are, they are all belonging to the same species. Now, at the very beginning, when human beings just evolved, they evolved somewhere in Africa. So that time, there were no human beings anywhere else. So Africa was the only place where human beings were seen. Now, these human beings, when the population of human beings started increasing too much, then Africa became less for them. I mean, the area became less for accommodating so many people. So gradually, they started moving around all the places throughout the world. And today, they are present throughout the world. So that is how evolution of human beings took place. So with this, we have reached towards the end of the lesson. So it is time to discuss some questions, to get an idea about where we are. So let us look at the first one. An example of homologous organs is our arm and a dog's foreleg, our teeth and an elephant's tusks, potato and runners of grass, all of the above. First of all, what is a homologous organ which has same origin, same structure but different function? Right? So here if you see our arm and dog's foreleg, do you think they have got different functions? No. Right? If you look at potato and runners of grass, what are they? So what are they? Both potato and in potato we have tubers, right? So tubers are the underground stem. Runners of grass, they are also the underground stem. So both of them fall under the same category and they serve the same purpose. So their function is the same. So they are not homologous organs. When you look at our teeth and elephant tusks, you see structure wise they are the same. So elephant's teeth are nothing but the tusks. But when you look at their function, are they the same? Our teeth helps us in grinding food, in chewing food. But for elephant, it is just for show. So our teeth and elephant tusks are those organs which are similar in structure but they have different functions. So that is why they are an example of homologous organs. Let us look at the next one. In evolutionary terms, we have more in common with a Chinese schoolboy, a chimpanzee, a spider, a bacterium. So if you look at all of them, with whom do you think we are more similar to? So with whom we have more similarities? Obviously, the Chinese boy, I don't think we have lots of similarities with the bacteria. Not at all. We don't have similarities with the spider as well. So we can say we have certain similarities with chimpanzee, but when we compare this with a Chinese schoolboy, the maximum similarities with we, we have is with this Chinese schoolboy. 
because we share the same body structure and design. Okay, so let's go ahead. How are the st areas of study, evolution and classification interlinked? So how can we say that evolution and classification are related to each other? You remember when we started talking about the evidences of evolution, I gave you an example, right? That why two brothers look very similar to each other, but the similarities between two cousins are not that much, right? Now, when we classify organisms, we classify them based on their similarities, right? Similarly, when we talk about evolution, we look for similarities. Based on the similarities, we can actually um, determine whether they have the same origin or not. So, in both the things, what matters is the similarities which two organisms share. So, that is how we can say they are interlinked. So, evolution helps to find similarities and thus origin of organisms. Whereas, classification classifies organisms based on their similarities. So, the base for both the things are similarities between organisms. Right? So, the more similarities two or the different organisms have, the more closely we can group them and the more closely they are related to each other more easily we can root out their evolution that is from where from where they evolved so that is how evolution and classification are interlinked let us look at the next one explain the terms analogous <coughs> and homologous organs with examples very simple i have discussed it in detail also Homologous organs are those which have a common origin and structure but different functions. The examples, four limbs of amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals. They all look so very similar in structure but they all serve different purpose. Whereas analogous organs are just the opposite. They perform similar function but they have different origin and structures. For example, the wings of bat, birds and insects. They are all used for flight, but they all have so very different structures. Let us look at the next question. Explain the importance of fossils in deciding evolutionary relationships. So how does fossil gives us evidence for evolution? Fossils give information about structure of various life forms that ever existed on earth. Because whatever remains we have, we can see the structure in that remains and we can get an idea about how those organisms look like. They help to connect the origin of two species. The best example is the reptiles and the birds. As I said, the birds also originated from the feathered dinosaurs. So fossils only helped us to connect the missing link that was the Archipteryx, which was a bird-like reptile. Fossil layers give an estimate about the duration of the organisms when they existed and the complexity of the organisms. That's because deeper the layer, older is the fossil. So the deeper it is, older it is. Similarly, the deeper it is, the simpler it is. So that is also true. So I think I can add that also. Deeper the air layer, older the fossil and simpler it is. So here you can see the fossil layers once again. So as you rise up, the complexity of the fossils increases. What evidence do we have for the origin of life from inanimate matter? Now we saw that we, we say that whatever living organisms we see, they all have a common ancestor. But have we ever thought that somewhere, maybe millions and billions of years ago, sometime, there would have been the first life which actually originated on earth. So from where did that first life originated? So it would have originated from some inanimate matter. So what was the evidence that that origin of life actually took place from non-living objects? Well, regarding this, a lot of study was done by a scientist named Halden. So Halden gave his theory stating that life would have developed from inorganic molecules. So then there was another couple, a scientist, that is Miller and Ure, who conducted a series of some series of experiments in their lab. What did they do? They created an atmosphere in their lab very similar to the atmosphere of the early earth. In early days, 
I'm not talking about some 10 years or 20 years back. It is like long, long back when there was there were no life forms on Earth. In those days, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere of the Earth. So what Miller and Urey did was they created an environment like that inside their lab. And what did they see? And in lab, they passed some electric sparks so that those sparks can act as a source of light. Later, they found that some organic compounds were formed. So what did they conclude? They concluded that in due course of time, inorganic compounds can get converted into organic compounds. Those simple organic compounds can then group together to form complex organic aggregates. And they can then group together to form life. Because if you look at us human beings, we are advanced form of living organisms. But what is our body made up of? It is made up of organic molecules. It is made up of the proteins. It is made up of the amino acids. So it is made up of all organic molecules, right? So our body is nothing but, we are nothing but aggregates of organic molecules. So those scientists actually proved that it is possible that inorganic molecules get converted into simple organic molecules and those simple organic molecules can get converted into complex organic aggregates which in turn can give rise to life. So these three scientists, Halden, Miller and Urey, gave have their contribution in telling that life originated from inanimate matter. Only variations that confer an advantage to an individual organism will survive in a population. Do you agree with the statement? Why or why not? So what is it saying? It is saying that if there are certain variations which are advantageous to that particular organism, only those variations will survive. Is that true or not? Let us look at the example of beetles. So in the beetles example, we saw that if there were too many, initially there were too many red beetles in the community. By variation, a green beetle was formed. So this green beetle was a result of variations. Now, crows started eating up the red beetles and the green beetles were safe. So that means this variation was advantageous to this Organism. That means for beetles, the variation which gave birth to a green colored beetle was advantageous. So did that mean that the green beetle survived? Yes, of course it survived. So that means this statement is true that variations which are advantageous to an organism will survive in a population. But here we have a term called only. Does that mean that only such variations will survive? This is true that variations which are advantageous to an organism will survive in a population. Why? Because of natural selection. Because nature will support it. Because it has the survival advantage for that species. So nature, natural selection will come into play and that particular variation will survive in a population. Now let us look at another example. Now in the same green colored beetles, when one blue colored beetles came up, so this was also a variation, right? So this was again a variation. But was this variation advantageous to the population? No, it was not. But when unfortunately some animal came and stamped over the green beetles, what happened? All the green beetles died and the population of the blue beetles started increasing. So in this case, even though the variation was not advantageous to the individual, even then, due to some other reason, the variation survived in the population. So this was genetic drift. So that is why it is not that, so we do not agree with this statement because it is not that only those variations which are advantageous to the organism will survive. Variations which are advantageous to the organisms will survive because of natural selection. Some variations which are even if they are not advantageous to the organism will sometimes survive due to genetic drift right okay so with this i will conclude this lesson and i hope that the video on heredity and evolution would have helped you to understand the basic concepts of genetics so please keep watching see you all in the next lesson thank you please visit www.examfear.com to watch more videos,
attempt free online test, get free study material, find tutors and mentors. Thank you once again.